black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I, I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me. And this look of, I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was, he, was, he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? See ya. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. Going to be speaking to uh, Theo, and I've titled the show Worst Day Ever uh, because he was out hiking, and he had a terrible experience. And I'll try and post some of the videos underneath this episode. Some of them are a little bit too large to email to myself, and so some of it might be screenshots. But you get an idea of the area that Theo was talking about as they were walking through this area. Uh, if you've had an encounter, shoot me. I don't know if that made sense. <laughs> Duke's sitting here. Uh, shoot me. If you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member. Uh, we have a shop at the top. You can get merchandise. It's a very cool site. I put a lot of work into the blogs. Uh, I try to put stuff up there I would, I would actually read. Uh, as opposed to just slamming stuff up there. So if you get a chance, check it out. SasquatchChronicles.com. I have uh, a fan favorite, Duke. And uh, as FS says on the site, Duke, uh, he says, uh, it's, he, I think he put up a meme of you. And I don't know if FS is a woman or a man. I'm assuming it's a man. But um, it says, uh, it's, it, I'm not saying it was a gugwee, but it's probably a gugwee. And it's it's a quotation from Duke, and I was laughing when I saw that. You know, sometimes it's fun. You got to laugh at yourself sometimes. But um, hey, how are you tonight, man? How are you doing? <laughs> Howdy, Wes, and hi to all the listeners out there. I'm doing actually pretty good. We're having a big weekend up here in the Big Sky Country. It's Big Sky Bigfoot Conference number three going on this weekend, and folks are coming in from not all, only all over the state, but from outlying states as well. I already got contacted by one who's a listener of both of our shows, by the way, and is going to be up here for the conference, wants to go out squatching with me. So if anybody's showing up to the conference, you know, uh, I'm actually going to be there tonight. Uh, I'm not speaking or anything. I'm just visiting. So if you're going to be there, you get a chance to uh, spot the Duke in the crowd, run screaming in the opposite direction. <laughs> <laughs> Where, where's the conference? What what city it's, is it? It's in, uh, it's in Hamilton. Uh, Hamilton is right here in the middle of the Bitterroot Valley, the pretty much sandwiched right in between Missoula and Stevensville and uh, over near Steve is one of my favorite spots to go squatching so uh, conveniently enough that's really close we might even put a little team together and go out and do some uh, hiking around here the conference is over uh, Saturday night and uh, they're predicting nice weather for uh, tomorrow and Sunday so I'm um, anticipating that uh, I'm going to be running around the woods with at least one person, if not a bunch here, probably Sundays, and take uh, advantage of the nice uh, clear skies, uh, beautiful uh, conditions. And we've been pretty much getting rained on here for about a week now, so I put out all the fires, but the temp dropped 30 degrees right away. It went from uh, 80s down to, like, 50s. (laughs) So that was a little bit brutal and sudden. So I haven't been doing much running around outside, kind of waiting for the rain to, to get done here and, Now the fires are out and you can actually see something and you don't feel like you're standing right next to a a barbecue grill all the time when you're out there. (laughs) Yeah, that's how it's been here in Washington, man. It's been brutal. And and it's funny because I always complain about the rain 
I think I should have been born in like Australia or someplace like that because I think I was born on the wrong continent because I actually hate rain. Uh, but after months and months of brutal weather and the rain and or not the rain, the fires and, um, you know, it being almost 100 degrees every day, it's so nice to see the rain. I was so happy to see the rain. I was like, oh, I've missed you. It's like an old love or something, man. When the rain showed up, I was like, I yeah. really I really missed you. <laughs> suddenly you like the rain. <laughs> yeah, a whole suddenly lot, right? I'm in love with the rain. Yeah. yeah. It was the same thing here, and it got really almost, uh, you know, in as much as we had fires of biblical proportions out here in the West this uh, this year, it was really bad, over a couple million acres burning up in total. Um, I know a lot of people out here in this part of the country, and for a while it got to be ridiculous because we'd be comparing pictures from our local areas of, well, how close is the fire to your house? Oh, mine's closer. Has your mountain burned down yet? Oh, we've lost three quarters of ours, you know, <laughs> A bragging contest. So I'm right in the middle of a fiery inferno. How are you guys today? Oh, same thing, huh? Yeah, it was bad out here. It was definitely bad out here. But if you're out there, if you're listening, and you're going to the Big Sky Conference uh, there in Montana, definitely hook up with Duke. I wish I was there, Duke. I wish I could go. Oh, it's going to be a hoot, I'm sure. There's a, a whole bunch of really wonderful people from around this area that show up to it every year. And, you know, even for the first one, we had people from way out there by Vancouver and whatnot came over for it. So uh, frequently end up with people uh, traveling quite a ways to, to show up to the conference. And, you know, around here we're sort of isolated in the middle of nowhere. So uh, Wyoming doesn't have one. The Dakotas don't have one. Um, you know, so it's kind of like those states de facto have to sort of come here for a conference because there's nothing anywhere near where they are otherwise. Yeah, no, absolutely. And like I said, I wish I could get a chance to go out there and and meet everyone at the Big Sky Conference. I'm going to try and make the Ohio Conference. The problem is the tickets sell out so quick. I know they got the Sasquatch Summit coming up here in Washington State. I'm going to try and make it out to that one. It's definitely like conference time of year, isn't it? It seems like one after another. There's one in Texas. There's one in, uh, what is it, Oklahoma or Arkansas. Uh, it seems like yeah. everyone's, everyone's doing a conference. Yeah, there's new ones popping up every year. And, you know, that's exciting because it makes it so that people that are interested in this usually don't have to travel quite so darn far to go to a conference. If there's one near you, that's kind of nice. And it, it gets the community in contact with each other. The people that have had the experiences are just curious and want to show up and find out something about it. Uh, you know, you make a lot of contacts with other nice people and make friends. So that's, you know, it's really, that's a positive thing. I think that's a good community building thing. Uh, and, yeah. you know, I think it's really nice for, for, uh, for the people to have that option that, hey, there's a, you know, there's an event going on that I can go to. And it's one of the things I'm interested in. And I'm going to meet a lot of other people that are interested in it there. So, you know, I think those things are really good. And I, I like the idea that there's more of them happening. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I had a blast at the <coughs> International Bigfoot Conference. But um, I was going to tell you, I got an interesting call from a lady. And these are tough, tough calls. You and I talked about it. it when you get someone on the phone and they're in tears, and they're telling you about what's going on around their property. And and there's a split moment where you think to yourself, I'm not qualified to deal with this. I'm not qualified to give advice in this situation. Uh, but I guess who, who the hell is qualified to give advice in a situation like that? But um, I had a lady, and I posted it to the blog. Um, I think it was the title of the blog is uh, We're About to Move or Ready to Move. Um, I'll have to go back and look at it. But. Uh, she had she had been living in this property for a long time. And, and one thing I'll say, it's on the East Coast. And I guess I'll leave it at that because I don't know if she wants too much information out. Uh, but she's on the East Coast and she recently retired. And they moved into this property 13 years ago. She recently retires. And she said over the 13 years, she started noticing weird things happening around the property very odd strange things happening around the property and she couldn't really say what it was she couldn't really say what was actually causing it and she kind of went into it a little bit but she's recently retired and these things are coming up to her property coming up to her windows and she said during the day and at night she'll hear what sounds like mumbling like two men outside her window talking but she can't understand what they're saying and it's not just her it's her husband it's her daughter uh, her daughter's had scratching at the window, tapping on the window. Um, and the minute they notice these things, they take off running. They run back into the wood line. And she's backed up to the National Forest. So uh, they retreat to the wood line. And she went out there, kind of looked around, and told me, she goes, I almost think I know where they're coming in and out. She's like, this huge game trail that looks like a Volkswagen bus has been driving down this game trail. 
She goes, yeah, I kind of think that's that. yeah. She goes, I kind of think that's where they're coming down. But she was in tears because uh, her dogs are terrified. Her dogs don't even want to go outside anymore. They just avoid going outside at all costs, and she'll have to take them out there, then immediately bring them back in. And even her neighbors know about it. And her neighbors shoot at these things constantly. She's talked to her neighbors, and in the middle of the night she'll hear pop, 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 you know, like an AR-15 going off. And it's firing at random, which is terrifying in itself. But um, she says that they and these things will kind of retreat back to her area. Um, And she told me lots and lots of stories. And I really hope that she comes on the air. I definitely it's hard to push someone to come on the air and talk about it, especially those encounters where they have them on their property. I've probably talked to 20 or 30 people in the same situation. But if you ask them to come on the air, they're like, yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, but in her situation, I th- and she's so scared, she's terrified for her life. But the more and more I listen to what's going on there, I started getting the impression, you know, she might be dealing with the more human looking type creatures. And what I mean by that is like the Patterson Gimlin type creature, especially if she's hearing mumbling. And I told her, you know, when you hear the mumbling, if you hear what sounds like two chimpanzees out there talking, you're in trouble. Um, but if you hear the mumbling, what sounds like language of these things talking back and forth, uh, you're probably dealing with a different creature. And again, all of this is my opinion, which means nothing. Uh, but and I said, honestly, I think if they were going to hurt you, there was one time where she's walking out to her car right before she retired and she left uh, work at like one thirty in the morning, starts walking out to her car. And she's like, I grew up in the woods. I've never heard anything like this growl before. And this thing growled at me, and she's like, I felt it. It felt like, I mean, I just felt this growl, and it was close. And she was in tears when she's telling it. She got in her car and basically headed off to work. And I was telling her in that situation, I think when they, now that I've had time to stop and really think about this, especially my own encounter, um, I kind of think when they growl at you, they're terrified, Um, which sounds like a strange thing to say. But I think it's a reaction, like you're too close. And that's their way of trying to get you to move away. I I really think that they're terrified when they growl at you. But she has all sorts of things going on on this property. And I think I surprised her. I think what she was looking for was for me to say, yeah, they're monsters. Execute them. (laughs) You know, execute every one of them. Set up the minefield now. Yeah, set up the minefield now. Get the bazooka ready. (laughs) And uh, I didn't. I didn't say that to her. And I think that threw her off. And I said, honestly, I, I think if they wanted you, they would have they would have had you by now. Um, and I, I don't see the quite the aggressive behavior I've heard on other encounters to where they really want you or they want you gone. And so, but I understand where she's coming from. I mean, hell, I would be terrified if I had these things on my property. It would bother me. Um, but I honestly think in her situation, after hearing the whole thing, I know it's very vague. Maybe I shouldn't even brought this up, but... It's very vague. I haven't told the whole thing. But as I sat and listened to her, I really think they are, they've been there and they've probably been watching her for a long time. And honestly, if they were going to hurt her at 1 30 in the morning, her walking out to her car being too close, that's a perfect opportunity to hurt her. Um, and they didn't. And yeah. so I really think in this situation, I think they probably live on the property. She had noticed, uh, she said when she first moved in 13 years ago, uh, there was. Um, you know, uh, six to eight deers almost every day in her yard. And she's noticed the deer population going down. Uh, Mm -hmm. She said most days you won't even see a deer. And if you see one, it's one or two, and that's it. And so I think it's a perfect area for her. But I was telling her about a lady in um, Kentucky that I talked to that's in a very similar situation. And five, five acres to the left of her and about seven acres to the right of her, she has neighbors. And almost the identical same situations going on, and they don't um, – on the – this is a long story. I'm rambling. You're supposed to stop me from rambling, Duke. Oh, I'm sorry. No, <laughs> I'm just enjoying the story so much. Well, I, I well, let you go. I don't know about that. But anyway, she uh, – this lady in Kentucky, what was going on was they were on the property. On both sides of her, they would take pop shots at this thing at these creatures. And it was more than one. It was several of these creatures. They would take pop shots at them. And what was interesting is um, as soon as the gunfire started, they would run to her property and she saw them. She heard the gunfire go off. She went out there, started shining a light. 
And I said, well, what did you see? And she said, one of these creatures was trying to hide behind a bush and was kind of looking at her. And she said, it looked very human-like in the face. The rest of it looked like an animal except for the face, but it was looking at her. And she said, I saw terror in this thing's eyes. This thing was scared. But on her property, she never took a shot at them. Well, her next door neighbor, all his dogs were killed. He had five very large dogs, German Shepherds, uh, Rottweilers, Pit Bulls. All, every single one of them had its neck broke and laid out in the yard. Um, that happened one night. Several nights later, the guy on the other side of her that likes to shoot at him, all of his chickens had their necks broke. Um, and they were just – nothing was taken. Nothing was eaten. But they were just killed just to be killed. And two of his horses had, his, had their necks broke, and they were just laying in the yard. Now, coincidentally, she has three dogs. None of her dogs have been touched. Um, she'll let them out early in the morning. She'll let them out at night, and they have not touched her dogs. And what I found interesting about this lady I was talking to um, there on the East Coast, she said that she has two – I think she has two or three dogs. And one dog was out all night. It took off. That She was scared. She thought for sure her dog was dead. And it didn't come back until the next morning, and it was scratching at the door. It wanted in. And so I, I really am starting to see a pattern with these creatures of revenge, of vengeance. Uh, if you wrong them, they will wrong you. In her situation, her dogs haven't been touched, you know, and, oh. and they're really not uh, going after her per se. They aren't throwing rocks at the house. The, the daughter did mention she heard something up on the roof. It sounded like a man walking across the roof. Um, but as far as aggression goes, what surprised me, it's, there really wasn't a lot of aggression. You know, a growl, you know, you get too close, it's going to growl at you. Right. But, and I understand why she's terrified. I don't want to diminish why she's actually terrified, because I would be, too, in the same situation. But I think in her situation, I think they've seen her for a long time. And again, this is my opinion. And I think if they were going to hurt her, they would have done it a long time ago. And the fact that she's recently retired and is home all the time, she's probably starting to notice this stuff. Prior yeah. to that, she probably didn't pay attention to it. Or maybe they're curious on why she's there all the time, um, as opposed to her. the pattern's been changed. You know, she left at one thirty in the morning every day, and now she's not leaving the house. So I think it's curiosity, and I think I threw her off when I when I said curiosity. And I, hopefully I brought her some comfort it, because I truly don't think that they're going to hurt her. I think if they would have, they would have done it by now. She's not leaving out food. One time she left out apples on the porch. And they typed them. Yeah, we and talked they, about that. Yeah, and they took them. Um, and they smashed all the ones that weren't ripe. She said some of them were hard as softballs, and they just smashed them in, in the ground. And then they, they took off with them. But she said the, the whatever it was actually got, walked up on the porch, took the apples, a huge bag of apples, and walked off with and she's never found it in the forest or anything uh but i wish more people in these situations would come forward nine times i would say 99.9 percent .9 of the time they don't want to come on the show they don't want no. to talk about it publicly they don't care if you change your name they don't care if you change the location they just don't want to they don't want to and i guess i under i can respect that uh, i mean it's just tough sometimes when you hear stuff like that she's even noticed um structures around her property I know a lot of people might cringe when I say this, but I told her to take gasoline as long as you don't burn the forest down. Walk out there, dump gasoline on it, and burn them. Burn every single one of them you see. And if you have a chainsaw, go out there and cut back that forest a little bit because you, you take away their cover. Now they can't come up and chatter at your window if yeah. you back that forest up a little bit. There's another guy I talked to in Alaska um, who had a very similar – I think it was Alaska or Florida. I can't remember now. Um, but he had a very similar situation, and he had noticed his neighbor had cut back his yard, had cut all the trees, all the fruit trees, everything, had cut his yard way back, and activity stopped, stopped in this situation. Uh -huh. And so, you know, beyond lighting the place up and setting up trail cameras, if none of that works, try some of these other things. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I'm, I'm throwing spitballs, hoping something like this works. But it's one of those situations you have to be very, very careful in. And you have to remember, this is someone's home. They're terrified. And this is going on in their home. So mm -hmm. I, I take that w a, a very, very seriously when I say something to someone because I don't have to deal with the recourse of whatever they do. Uh, the burning the thing down, I can tell you why I said that. But it has worked in the past. But yeah. it, it was fascinating, man, and, and I hope to get her on the show. 
Well, my heart totally goes out to that poor lady and then anybody that's in a situation like this. It's just absolutely horrifying. And, you know, if it was a researcher or something, he'd be sitting there drooling with their eyes wide open going, ooh, awesome. But these people are not. They don't know anything about this in most cases. They have no idea what's causing this. You know, once they get to the point where they actually see something, then they're like, oh, my God, I need to talk to somebody. I think I got a Bigfoot around here. And then they get really freaked out. Well, there's something here that shouldn't even exist, and it's bothering me. So if you think about it, you know, they're in the middle of a really hair-raising situation, ongoing, day after day. They've got these weird things happening. They, they may or may not know these what creature it is that's up there messing around with them on their property. In addition to all that stress, they don't want to go on the air and talk about their story. So that makes perfect sense to me. You know, I'd be willing to bet that some of them, after they've moved or the situation has changed or whatever and things have calmed down to be willing maybe at that point to talk about it but right in the middle of it i really don't blame them man i mean that's you know it's like you one of us if we were like right in the middle of having our encounter and went oh well let's take a quick break i'll do a radio show about our encounter and then come back and finish it I don't think that would fly very well, you know. I wouldn't. I, I might be up for that just to get out of the encounter, but then the coming back part afterwards wouldn't be very appealing. But no, I think you're dead on with all of your advice to her. You definitely, you know, if they're that uh, close up on the property, get the get the tree line further back. They don't like being out in the open, even in the dark. They don't like doing that. If they got cover, they feel more comfortable. You know, if they got structures that they're making near your house, you know, what what are they making? We talked about it, and it sounds like they were just basically building blinds so that they had little hidey holes they could pop back into and you wouldn't be able to spot them from the house again. So they could make a quick dash when somebody came out the door or something. And, uh, and probably the one that growled at her was in that situation. She came out, and it was just too close to her, and it was trying to back up, and uh, she scared him, so him or her, whichever, and it growled at her. And I think you're dead on with the language thing, too. I haven't uh, heard much in the way of reports of the uh, the other varieties making anything that sounds like uh, human conversation. And the ones that we do hear that about seem to conform to the type 1 variety, which is to say the paddy type. And they're just as smart as we are. You know, uh, if, if they were big, dumb apes, we'd have one in a zoo, man. Just think about it. You know, everybody that says, well, it's some kind of big, dumb ape running around the woods. Dude, why haven't we caught one and got one in the zoo yet? Obviously, they're not big, dumb apes. They've got to be just as smart as we are to avoid detection, even with all the training they've got and everything. So, you know, they're in their element in the woods. As soon as they get back in the woods, good luck to you. You know, they can fade pretty fast and get out of your, your range of view and everything. So, again, it's like these things are up on our property. What are they doing there? Well, like you pointed out, the neighbors are shooting at them. They're not happy with the neighbors. They're killing the neighbors' dogs and livestock to show how not happy they are about it. But this lone woman leaves them alone. So they're on her property. Uh, they don't want to start hostilities. They're seeing how that's working on other properties. So they're leaving her pets and stuff alone. And they still are messing around with the house, and I think you're right on on that, too. She just changed her pattern uh, that she's been in for a long time, and you're right. They've probably been watching her for a long time. And uh, now they're kind of curious what's going on. You're not leaving every night all the time. What's happening here? What's different? So, and the fact that, uh, again, she, she, they are very much aware that she's aware of them at this point. There's no doubt about that. And uh, they're probably just kind of curious as why, you know, this is nice. There's a human that's not shooting at us or not helping us or anything, but at least they're not shooting at us. And what's the deal with this one? So that's probably liable to make them even more curious. So, you know, you don't really hear, like, anything from the story that I've heard from you so far where they're doing actually, you know, really aggressive stuff, uh, shaking the doors or beating on the walls or something like you hear in some of these encounters where they're, they, it does sound like they're actually mad at the homeowner. So I think you gave her straight up some pretty good advice. I don't know what, uh, what else she could really do other than moving. And in this situation, it doesn't sound like they're hostile. I mean, like, they're on her side almost. I'd almost take that as having a personal bodyguard on your property. It's not likely that somebody else is going to come sneaking onto your property in the middle of the night with those things hanging around there at least. Yeah, I agree with everything but the researcher part. I think researchers would turn tail and run just like everyone else. <laughs> No, no, I'm saying real researchers, not those jokers that call themselves <laughs> researchers. The ones that put out the books and stuff. Yeah, that's. I'm not talking about them. Yeah. No, we can disagree on that. You know, we disagree about that privately several times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the fans would probably be shocked to hear how often I'm on your side when you start griping about researchers. Yeah. The reason why I don't complain about it too much on the show is because no one cares. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
But no, it was fascinating. And I really hope that she comes on the show because, um, you know, I, I, my heart goes out to her and I, and I feel bad that she's in that. The frustrating part is people in that situation, like I said, 99% of the time, they will not come on the show. Um, and they have the best information. I, I was surprised uh, when you managed to get the brothers from We Need Help to actually come out and talk about their encounter because that was another one where it was ongoing. Yeah, and they were tough to get on. Those guys did not want to come on. They didn't want to talk about anything paranormal. They didn't, um, you know, it's almost like they tried to hide it. And then when we got start to, when we started talking, I think people are surprised they bring up something like that. I think they think I'm going to eat them alive. And when I don't, it kind of throws people off. They're not really sure what to think. Uh, because I do believe some of that stuff goes on. I mean, I, it's hard. You would be disingenuous not to believe some of that stuff doesn't go on. What is it? Is it Sasquatch related? I don't know. Um, could, you know, what is a Sasquatch, I guess, is our first question. And then you answer that, and I can tell you if the paranormal goes on or not. Until we get to that point, I can't tell you if, you know, <laughs> I can't tell you what they do. or Because you do hear a small percentage of people talk about this weird stuff that goes on, and there's no answer for it. Yeah. Um, and, and when you hear it over and over and over again, it's not quite as prevalent as some of the other people talk about, you know, online or in the Bigfoot world, it's not quite as prevalent, the paranormal stuff, but it does go on. And so you kind of have to address it when it does happen. But um, I don't know. I agree with you. And I think, you know, some of that is, uh, like I said, on one of my shows recently, paranormal is basically just things that we haven't been able to explain with science yet. It doesn't mean it's not an actual phenomena. There's something going on there. But we haven't figured out how to quantify it and rationalize it with our math speak and the way we try and do with everything else. And so until we get to a point where we have a working theory that's testable and we can try and work on that and figure out what is causing this strange occurrence, we really don't have an answer for it. Well, at that, it's still paranormal. It doesn't mean it's not real. You know, a lot of the technology we have today, we just take for granted. If you would have shown this stuff that we're using right now to do this conversation to somebody 150 years ago, like the top of their head would explode. They, they would think it was black magic and, you know, vile sorcery or something. Right. And some kind of weird thing going on. And there's some kind of, a, you know, I don't even know what this device uh, is made out of. It's got some kind of substance. It's like animal horn or something. And, you know, they don't know what plastic is. So that, that's 150 years ago. Take that as an example. So a lot of the stuff we take for granted today as just commonplace to somebody from that time period would seem like super magic, uh, you know, unbelievable, ununderstandable type of thing. So just because we don't have a quantifiable answer for it right now doesn't mean that it's not happening and that it couldn't exist. An answer, uh, example of that would be infrasound. There's a lot of weird side effects reported by people that have been around Bigfoot multiple times disorientation, nausea, um, you know, and, and a lot of this stuff. And uh, Bigfoot all Oz Kunbo has done a bunch of research on that because he has the uh, actual access to equipment and data on it, uh, working uh, as a consultant for NASA. And uh, he's, he's convinced that a lot of the phenomena that's related to Bigfoot is actually, uh, you can be explained with uh, infrasound, which it seems likely that they can probably generate. Tigers and whales and a lot of other animals can, but the larger ones seem to be able to do that. And in as much as they're huge, uh, they probably can do it too. So, um, again, this is one of those things where it's like, well, it seemed like it vanished or, you know, I got near it and all of a sudden this sick feeling hit me and I felt like I was going to, you know, keel over or whatever kind of weird description you're getting. A lot of this stuff could actually potentially be explained by infrasound. So there may may be answers for a lot of this stuff. Just because somebody says something weird happened doesn't automatically mean it's woo woo and, you know, they're making stuff up or something, you know, something genuinely happened. We just don't know the exact explanation for it yet. I couldn't agree more. And there's a lot of things that are unexplained in this world. You know, most people can't explain, you know, get a scientist to explain um, demonic possession or get a scientist to explain uh, some of this other stuff that goes on. You, you can't explain it with science. It makes no sense. No. Uh, but we all know it goes on or some of us know it goes on. But Yeah. Well, and again, that doesn't mean that it's not real. It, it really is real. We just haven't figured out how to quantify it in a way with our math speak that makes sense to us yet. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that. Well, you'll have to, uh, you have to come back on and tell me how the uh, Big Sky Conference went. I didn't get an invite, so, you know, it's... Well, me neither. <laughs> I guess you got to be a researcher to show up at a place like that. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not even a good enough researcher to get invited, I guess. I'm just, you know, the lowly Duke that lives here in Montana, 40 miles from where they're having it. Yeah. No, I'm just joshing you guys. I was, I was actually one of the speakers at the first one, so I've been, I've been there before. No, I heard it's great. I hope everyone going to the Big Sky Conference there in Montana has a great time. And if you get a chance, uh, swing by, say hi to Duke. Uh, he's, he's approachable. For sure, you guys. I don't bite anybody's head off. I ain't got any teeth to do that. Come on over and shake my hand <laughs> and visit with me, and, and you'll be surprised at how much of an actual normal person that I, I really can pretend to be. <laughs> no, I'm a crazy hermit. That's true. No, I mean, well, I know you're live from the Batcave there in Montana, but if people out there, they get a chance, go to YouTube, uh, type in Brian Sullivan or type in um, World Bigfoot Radio, and you'll find a show. I try and post it to the blog all the time. Uh, when he has one and i know you've been pumping him out uh, lately a lot duke and you know i appreciate it i always like to listen to other people's shows i actually don't listen to my own show anymore so it's nice to go and listen to other people's shows and hear what what they have going on so uh keep it up yeah, man. just to let the uh the listeners know uh here recently i've been doing a little bit more extra work on the show and i've kind of upgraded it to a a podcast plus format so it's not flat out video but I have images going on the screen the whole time that I'm talking to the the uh, guest, and sometimes it's really nice because they'll mention like, "Well, I got a picture of this," and uh, I'll actually get a chance to include it. So when they're talking about the picture, there it is. Or recently, we did a show on tree structures, and we had over like 80 photos in that one where we were talking about different kinds of tree structures and, and comparing photos of them from all over the country from 10,000 feet from sea level from the middle of the continent from the edge of the continent and so on and so forth so with uh sometimes with some of the guests and stuff that i have on that format is just spectacular because it really helps me have the visual images there of what we're talking on and it comes across more like a documentary but it's basically a talk show i'm sure a lot of you listen to it and uh, i'd like to thank you for posting it wes i really appreciate that and you know i'm surprised frequently at how many people that are regulars on sasquatch chronic will show up on YouTube and leave comments on my videos on there. I, I love it. Thanks, you guys. It's the best really fans enjoy ever, it. man. Some of the smartest, yeah, some of the smartest, best comments that I get on there are from your fans, man. You've got a, you scooped them up. you got all the good fans. <laughs> well, I can't disagree with that, man. There's definitely, uh, definitely great ones on there. So uh, if you get a chance, check it out. World Bigfoot Radio, Brian Sullivan on YouTube. He goes by Duke. Don't call him Brian. Otherwise, he'll rip your head off for some odd reason. But, uh, <laughs> Duke, I appreciate you coming on, man, and uh, uh, doing a little intro with me and uh, let me bounce some of my uh, ideas off you, man. Thank you very much. Oh, you're totally welcome, Wes. Thanks for letting, having me on the show again. And just to let all of your listeners know, I'm going to be having Wes and Woody on my show here soon. And you can just wonder what it is that we're going to be talking about until that show comes out. <laughs> Yeah, well, hopefully it'll be exciting. You never know. I appreciate it, man. And thank you again for coming on. You're welcome, Wes. Everybody have a great day. And there it goes. Duke from World Bigfoot Radio. Uh, definitely check it out on YouTube. And uh, Duke's a great guy. I like to bounce. Uh, he's one of the few people out there that wants me uh, vent. And so <laughs> he, uh, I, I love the guy to death. Uh, let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Theo to the show. Theo, thanks for coming on. Hey, thank you for having me. I really appreciate you taking the the time to actually read, you know, my story that I had sent you. And um, I wasn't sure if you know if anybody was going to read it or what, because I, I know you you know you got to be a busy guy and stuff like that all the time. So, but I really appreciate you you know, reaching out to me. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I do actually read every email that comes in. Sometimes I don't always respond back, but uh, <laughs> even the bad ones, uh, it's just me sitting here reading them. So, um, you know, uh, I, I appreciate you sending me the encounter and actually taking the time to come on. So thank you. Um, how long ago did your encounter take place? It was in August. And as a matter of fact, I brought it up as uh, August 5th that day. So relatively recent, um, if you would go ahead and kind of start from the beginning, Theo, and tell us what happened. Okay. Um, my girlfriend and I, I've known her for a lot of years and um, kind of um, uh, recently divorced for about a year now. And her and I, we hooked up again and as friends and stuff like that. Well, 
she, I got her into hiking and started out with trails and stuff like that. Well, I'm an avid hiker. I go out um, all the time, constantly. I'm always out in the bush. I'm always out in the woods all the time. Uh, different areas, um, anywhere from the forest to uh, desert areas. I know how to survive. I know how to track people. I know how to track animals. Um, I know how to find water, all kinds of stuff. So she and I, we decided one day um, on that particular weekend, you know what, we're going to go up to Big Bear. And there is this one trail that we've been dying to to hike, and it's called Pine Knot Trail. And it's up on the opposite side of uh, Big Bear Lake, and it's on the east side, as a matter of fact. And uh, it's here in the San Bernardino National Forest. So, you know, we got to pack all up our gear, started driving up there on old Highway 38, and, um, and it was about 10 miles away from the actual Big Bear City. We're chit-chatting, having a good conversation, and um, then... All of a sudden, she's looking out, you know, on the passenger side. I'm concentrating on the road because the road, old, old Highway 38, it's not a wide road at all. It's just for going up traffic and coming down, and you don't have that much room in between at all, or even just to pull over because it's, it's a original highway. So we're chit-chatting, having a conversation, and then all of a sudden, she says, I just saw a monkey. So I just kind of looked at her and I said, you saw a what? She says, I saw a monkey. I said, what do you mean you saw a monkey? And I'm trying to slow down, but at the time that we were driving up, there was more traffic building up in, in back of us. Well, it turns out they had like some kind of a cycling event up there in Big Bear City. So the traffic was building up in back of us already. So I couldn't find any way to really slow down and pull over to the side. And so I asked her, you know, what did you see? Tell me what you saw. So she explains to me, she says, it was tall. She was about as big as me. And her and I both are five, six tall. And um, I weigh 170 pounds. And she's, she's like, like right around one, I don't know, 135 or so. And she says it was as big as us. And it was standing up on two legs. So it had two feet, but it was standing up on two legs, and it had long arms. She says, but it looked like, almost looked like a monkey, but it was standing straight up, and it was looking towards our way as we're driving up the hill. She says, but it was standing there, and it was at the base, kind of like at the base of the, of the mountain area. And so I didn't say anything, and she says, it was dark. It was, it was a dark color, almost like a black color, but it was all covered with hair except for a little bit on the face. That's all she saw. So we kind of chit-chatted about it a little bit, um, trying to carry on a conversation about it. I was trying to get a little bit more detail, but she didn't have any, didn't have any more detail about that. And so I asked her, you know, what do you think about the possibility, you know, of a Bigfoot being out there? And she says, I think that from what you've shared with me, she says, I think that there is a, a possibility that something is out there, you know, and if something else out there could exist that we don't even have a clue about or very little. So we were driving up towards the Big Bear City to find our destination. Now, to kind of back up about a week and a half before, right before this happened she was at work she works crazy hours just like i do she works in riverside totally different kind of a job and one day she had some downtime so she called me and she asked me hey what are you doing and i told her as well i'm listening to uh, a story on youtube and she's what kind of a story well wes i've been listening to your show for two years solid now and I actually came across your show just purely by accident. And I am so glad that I came across it because I listen to it every single chance I get. And um, I've learned an awful lot from you and you listening to your show and other stories and other people that call in. And um, 
And so um, I told her, I said, well, you know, there's a show that I listen to. It's called Sauce Watch Chronicles. I've been listening to it for a while now. And she was really interested. And it kind of freaked me out a little bit because I thought she was going to start making fun of me. But she was, you know, really sincere. So I sent her a couple stories, you know, from YouTube. And I sent them to her. And she actually listened to them. So now to kind of get back into where we're driving up, she told me that she listened to both of the stories and that there there is a strong possibility that something else could be out there. So the way I look at it is there's got to be something else out here in the, in the world besides a bunch of us knuckleheads running around. I mean, that's right. just the way I look at it. Yeah. So we get up to Big Bear City. We find the trail. It's on the opposite side of the Big Bear Lake. And we find the parking. It was pretty easy to find. And um, we park at the trailhead, and there were three other vehicles besides us. We get out, put all of our gear on and stuff. Well, I put my gear on. She had um, her hydro pack, and I always make sure she has at least some kind of a knife inside to where she could grab it fast because we're out in the, in the bush. We're out in the tree line and stuff like that. And I'm carrying my pack weighs about 65 pounds, and that's actually pretty average for me wherever I go. And I have a machete on my side at all times, and I have a, another knife and stuff like that with me at all times. And so we start on the trail. We're having a good conversation. Everything's going really good. And, um, you know, we don't see anybody else around. We're on the trail. Or, you know, we go about five miles in. And then right after that, we started seeing on the trail, because the trail gets a little bit more narrow, narrow, narrow as, as you go in deeper. We'd never been on this particular trail before, so we're just following it, you know, as we see it. We pass a campsite. We can hear people laughing, talking. We can smell the smoke and stuff like that. We pass them up. We're going a little bit deeper, probably about another two and a half, almost three miles back, a little bit further in, in the bush. We're walking through. Now in this area, there's huge wild ferns all over Big Bear up there. And some of these ferns grow taller. I mean, like I said, I'm 5'6", and some of those ferns grow taller than, than myself. They can grow up to like 7 feet tall, and they're just all over the place. And you have to walk right in the middle of all of this besides the forest itself. And if there's some really, really thick, super dark areas. So her and I were talking, and then all of a sudden, I note I start I start noticing she doesn't see it right away, but you know how you're walking on a trail through the bush, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's like either smaller trees or big bushes with branches. Well, I started noticing right away in that area where we're at, there were tree snaps to where. They're like little branches, probably about maybe in some anywhere from a half inch to two inches thick. They were broken, but they were twisted, but they were pointed down towards the actual trail. And I noticed that right away, and we and we saw that. We both saw that. It didn't really click with her right away, but you know, for me, reading and you know, doing my own little research and stuff like that. From what I do know, that's them, like, marking, basically telling us as people, like, you stay on your side. This is this side belongs to us over here. And that's, I mean, that's what I've read before and talked to a few other people. You know, we're still on the trail. We're, we're doing our thing. And then all of a sudden she stops and she looks around and she says, what is all of that? And I says, what do you mean? She says, all of these branches are just broken. And they're pointed towards the trail. She says, but they're not snapped off. They're all twisted. She says, what is that? You know what that is. So I kind of told her what I thought it was and what I've read on it. And she was just real quiet. She didn't say anything. And so we kept on walking. We got up, you know, we passed some beautiful scenery. I have a lot of pictures and stuff like that. And we got up to one of our our points of destination 
Um, it's about almost 12 miles in, and it's called uh, Skyline View. And up there at the very top, I mean, you have a panoramic view of basically 360 degrees around you. And you're at least about seven, 8,000 feet up. And it's, it's, it's beautiful up there. And it was a nice day. It wasn't too hot. It wasn't too cold. It was just right. There were a couple other people up at the trail. We took our gear off. We had a little bit of lunch. I always make sure, you know, I packed a nice little lunch for us. We ate, hydrated. So we start walking back down the same way. And then at a certain point, the trail actually splits off into six other different trails. And I asked her, well, what do we do? Want to go back the same way? And she's like, no, she said, let's try a different way. And before I could even, you know, get my map out and look at her and like that, she said, let's take this one over here. The one to the furthest to our left. And it was Mark Cabin Trail. And I looked at it at first, it looked like, you know, for at least a, a good mile to me, it looked, it was pretty well maintained. And so um, I said, okay, let's go. So we started walking. We were talking and everything like that, a little tired out, but we were carrying on a good care of conversation. Now, myself, when I, whenever I go out, just me, myself, um, she's not at that point yet, but I do so much hiking. Sometimes uh, just a regular day hike for me is like 20, sometimes 25 miles. And that's, that's actually really average for me. So I'm used, I'm used to really going way in, inside the bush and stuff like that, spending hours out there. So I was kind of concerned for an asterisk. Are you sure you want to go this way? It looks like, you know, it, it, it's, it's way in there. She says, yeah, I, I, I want to do this. I want to do this. So we're walking down cabin trail. We're about five miles in. And then it starts getting a little bit thicker, a little bit darker. And it gets really thick, really dark, really fast. We go about a half a mile from there, from that point, and it starts dipping down into the actual wood line. And it gets a lot darker really fast. The fern is as high as our heads, literally. And so we're walking through that wild fern, and um, that's when um, our little walk, our hike, it turned, it started turning really weird really fast. As we were walking in there, there's on the on our right side, there's um, you know tree line and everything like that. It's really thick, really dark, but it kind of goes into like a ravine. And from from what I saw, it looked like it probably went at least to probably about eight feet down on our on our right hand side. But the trees were were massive or tall. On our left-hand side, as we're walking through the wild fern, on our left-hand side, there's like a, you know, like a small mountain area right up above us on our left-hand side. And from where we were, it had to have been where the tree line was probably at least about maybe 12 feet high on our, on our left-hand side. But it was also really thick with pine trees and bush and stuff like that. And it was also really dark in the area that we were at. On our left-hand side, that's when we started hearing. And at first, I just kind of just look and I thought, okay, it's a raccoon or something like that. Um, you could hear walking, but it wasn't an animal. It wasn't, it wasn't on all fours. This was walking just like a human. And at first, I thought it was somebody up on top roaming around. But then I thought I looked at the area, and I'm like, there's no way in hell that this is this could be a person up here walking around. This this is way too thick up there. And there's a lot of manzanita up there. And, so, I mean, you can't walk through manzanita like that. I mean, it's, I mean, there's, uh, it's, there's no way. There's no way a person, you know, can walk through there like that. And you could hear it crunching. It was really loud, but it was walking on two two legs, two feet. And she turned around. She kind of looked at me, and I said, "Well, let's you know just keep on walking." And then um, 
we started slowing down a little bit. Um, we kind of switched. She was in back of me. So I took my machete out and I didn't, I didn't feel comfortable at that point. I started getting a weird feeling. I started getting like goosebumps on my arms. And I looked back at her and I asked her, are you okay? She said, yeah. She said, let's just, let's just go. And we could still hear it up on our left-hand side. Then all of a sudden, on our right-hand side, we hear it was like a, a whistle. It wasn't a huge, loud whistle, but it was a whistle. And I can't imitate it because I don't know how to whistle. But it was, it was a whistle. It was just a... Uh, it lasted like maybe a second. It was just a straight long whistle. And, um, and then whatever it was that was up on our left hand side, it kind of just slowed down and it came to a stop. We kept on walking. I'm looking to my left. And as we're walking on our right hand side, again, you could hear something walking in that tree line and it was big. It was pretty damn big, whatever it was you could hear snaps of branches and stuff like that. I mean, it was pretty damn big. I turned and I looked at my girlfriend and she just looked at me like she was, she was scared. And, um, I told her, I said, we're going to be okay. So at that, at that point I had her, um, take her knife out. It was a little six inch knife, but I mean, it was something. So she held it in her right hand, her left hand, I had her grab onto the back of my pack. And so we're walking through the bush line. And then um, as we're walking, then all of a sudden on our right hand side, you hear it was not quite like a scream, but it was like more like a, ah, but it was, it was deeper, but you could feel, um, I don't know how to explain it, um, like a vibration from it. And you could, I mean, it was clear and it wasn't that far away from us, actually. If I had, if I have had to guess, it was probably about maybe 40 feet away from us, but it was in the ravine area, but it was in, in the trees. It wasn't that far away from us at all. Then all of a sudden, whatever it was on our left-hand side, it started picking up speed, started walking really fast. And I'm 47 years old. I'm a grown man. But I tell you what, I got scared, and I got scared really fast. At that point, we're, we're walking a little bit more briskly. I have my machete out. And um, then all of a sudden, we started picking up on a weird smell smelled like between a, a wet dog and like rotten trash. And that came from the left side of us. Didn't smell anything from the right-hand side where this other thing was. It was up on our, on our left-hand side. And you could smell it. It was pretty pungent. It was nasty. She was almost in tears at that point. I was pretty scared. I can imagine. I can um, imagine. We kept on walking <clears throat> on this trail. I'm, I have like a death grip on my machete. All I thought about was, and I had just had a weird feeling. I had a very strong feeling. I had a strong sense at that time was we're not going to make it out of here. I just had that feeling and I wasn't panicking. Something just told me, you're not going home, buddy. I was scared. And um, so we, um, we kind of come to uh, the top of this trail. And it was about four feet. We had to walk up to the top of this trail. It was a little bit of a clearing. And um, we noticed right away there was like the logging area. And a lot of trees were cut down, big tractors, dozers. Um, I don't know what they're called, tractors like these, these big claws that pick up the trees and stuff like that. They were all over the place, but there was nobody around. And mind you, this is on a Saturday. 
so there was no logging operation going on. However, there were cabins just from what we walked through, I counted probably at least about 40 cabins all over the place in that general area. So those had to have been for the people that were logging in an area. But the weird thing is there was nobody there in any of the cabins. There were like, you know, American flags out and stuff like that. Porch lights were on. You could see stuff in the windows and everything like that, but there was nobody around. So we could still hear the ruckus on both sides of us. I have her right there with me. And she told me, she says, I'm scared. And I told her, I says, so am I. I says, we're going to get through this, and I'm going to do everything I can to get you home. And um, so I walk up to one cabin, the first cabin, and I noticed that all these cabins, they had ADT security signs on them. So I figured, okay, well, if they have security signs, well, then they have to have alarms on them. So my thought was, if something comes start getting a little bit too close to comfort to us or start, you know, acting crazy with us. I'm going to kick one of these damn doors in or I'm going to break a window or something and set these alarms off. I go up to the first cabin, knock on it, look through the window. Nobody's there. I can see furniture inside and stuff like that. There was another one right next to that, probably about four or maybe five feet away from that. I walk over to that one. Nobody's there either. And I was really, really debating whether I should break a window or something like that because I just wanted to get the hell out of there. And um, I didn't like seeing her scared like that, and I didn't didn't like being like that. So um, we turned around, we looked at each other, she says, well, let's just keep on going. Let's get out of here. So we made our best judgment because there at one point in the trail, we actually thought about should we go back the same way we came, but we knew that we were way too thick in there and we didn't want to go back to whatever it was that was following us on both sides, mostly on the left-hand side, because it seemed like the one on the left-hand side, wherever it was, it was, I think it was more, um, the only word I could use was taunting us. It was letting us know that it was there. But at the same time, I got the feeling that we weren't welcome in that area. We weren't wanted. And so at that point, we made a decision. We're just going to keep on pressing forward. And now at this time, in that little logging area that that we were right in the middle of, there's tree lines all the way around this whole area. And um, it it was dark. It was a very dark area. And that's the kind of thing that kind of threw me off because we didn't hear any squirrels. Didn't see any raccoons, no sign of wildlife whatsoever. And I go all over the damn place. I hike trails. I climb over mountains, rocks, everything like that. And I tell you what, I always see wildlife out there wherever I'm at. We didn't hear it, and we didn't see it this whole entire time. It was dead silent. It was it was quiet. Even though the sun was out over us, it was still a very, very dark area, and that's what I found very odd about that area. And I just had that feeling like you're not going to go home. I was scared, but my main concern was, you know, I was going to get my girl out of there one way or another. So we decided to keep on walking. In my email that I had sent you, my story, I kind of gave you a little bit of a short version of it. But at the point where we were at, and we could still see a little bit of the trail, but then it kind of like forked off into two other areas. So we got to that point, and I'm just, I'm panicking at this point. Because these trails at this point, they're not kept up at all. You could tell that they're barely walked through at all. And I'm just like, I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, it's like, what the hell do I do? And it's like, I got to make a, a judgment call here and I need to do something fast because I need to get this girl out of here. Um, we decide to stick to the middle one. So we're walking down and then we hit another really thick area. <clears throat> it gets from bad to worse really fast for us. As we're walking through this area, we could see cabins up above right ahead of us. 
probably about another 30 feet away from us, another little set of cabins. So we're walking really fast. She's still hanging on to the back of my backpack. And I tell her, don't let go. Whatever you do, don't let go. I have my machete out still. I ain't putting this thing away for nothing. And my machete that I carry, um, it's, it's lightweight, but it's made of really good, you know, steel. And um, it measures uh, 22 inches long. And this thing's razor sharp. I keep it razor sharp at all times. And we get up to the second set of these cabinets. So as we get up to there, um, we're walking through really cautiously. But on this side where we were at, the forest was a little bit more thicker and there were more trees in between the cabins. And I'm looking around, looking around. We still don't hear any sign of any kind of wildlife whatsoever. But whatever it was that was on our left-hand side, it's in back of the tree line in the cabins where we were at. And we could hear it. We could literally hear this damn thing. It was moving around. It was stepping on stuff. You could hear things breaking. And then we could hear the one on the right-hand side of us but it was like, it was weird because it's like if they had to go around um, this mountain area, because we noticed that there were huge rocks. So it had, I, I, my guess is it had it, it had to either climb or go around these rocks, these big, big, huge boulders to get on the other side of where we were at. So we didn't hear anything on that side for at least about a good five minutes. So um, my main focus was over here on our left-hand side behind these cabins and the tree line. And my girlfriend was just really quiet. She had tears in her eyes. And I felt really, really bad. It's like, man, I feel like crap right now because if something came out, there's probably not a damn thing or very little that I could do about this. So we're walking through the cabins. We finally start picking up a little bit of like a, a dirt trail. So we're, we're walking that and um, we're, we're walking fast. We're walking really, really fast. And I, I was going to attempt to turn around and talk to her and ask her if she was all right. But she said, just keep going, just keep going, just keep going. She said, I just want to get the hell out of here. And so we're, I mean, we didn't run because I told her, says, whatever you always do, don't run because from, uh, what I know from hiking all these years and stuff like that, you run, you become food really fast. And so we're walking fast, but not running. And we're pacing ourselves really good. As we start seeing a little bit more clearer, probably about 40, 50 feet in front of us, up this, this little trail that we're walking, we get up to this other little clearing. And then all of a sudden we heard like a big snap. And it was, it was uh, like a big branch that was snapped. Well, we both stopped. We turned around because we had a little bit of a clearing on both sides of us, at least probably about a good maybe 25, 30 feet around us. And we, as soon as we turned around, we looked back. This thing, it walked out. It wasn't afraid. It wasn't afraid of us, most definitely, but it walked out. We never saw its face. We saw just the, the back view of it. It was big, um, estimated probably about a good seven feet, and I could see the whole back of it, and it was like a, a dark dark brown. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't fur. It was hair. It was long. It was kind of shiny, actually, like if it, it was um, almost like if it was groomed. It had, it was thick. It was thick and it was wide. It probably weighed about close to about 400 pounds, my guess is. And it was built very, very powerful. We turned around. We didn't ask any questions, didn't talk about it. We just got the hell out of there. At that point, we started walking down that trail so damn fast. At one point, we almost tripped over each other. Then we started seeing like a little paved road. And that was, to us, that was um, civilization, even though it was just a road. I started getting really happy really fast. I had a pee really bad on top of that. Um, as we were approaching that road, 
we saw a big white SUV. It was a four-door, big white truck. And um, it was lifted up here and like that. They drove up as we were walking really fast, almost literally to the point running at this point. Came up to us. They they stopped. The driver pulled his window down, and he asked us, so are you all right? At that time, I, mean, I was probably pasty white, and so was she. And we said yes. And he asked us, he says, did you just come from Cabin Trail? I said yes. And he just looked at us, and there were three other people. He had a passenger and then two guys in the back of the truck. Well, I noticed that the, the passenger in the front of the cab, he had a 308. I know about weapons. He had a 308, and he had a big scope on that damn thing. And he says, well, we work up here. He says, but I'm going to tell you something. He says, we never, ever sit in these cabins on the weekends. And I just looked at him, and he says, you're all right where you're at. He says, just follow this paved road, and it'll take you all the way down to the trailhead, right where everybody parks their cars, to get back up to the main trail. He says, your car will be there. And so we waited and uh, for a couple seconds, um, and then uh, we got a drink of water really fast. We started going down that road, and we looked back a couple of times and they were just parked there in their truck. And uh, I guess they were talking amongst themselves inside the truck and stuff like that. But, um, they stayed there for a couple, for a couple minutes until we were walking down the road and passed, you know, around the corner of, of that mountain. And then we could hear the truck. It, it just took off. It they just left after that. We made it back to the cars and to where the trailhead started. We didn't say much. We packed up, and um, we got the hell out of there. Yeah, did you guys talk about it afterwards, though? Was there ever a time where you guys sat? And um, it was it was a, a little bit of a quiet ride at first. Um, I, um, I, felt, I felt so screwed up. I, I, was, I was scared at the same time. I was glad we were in the car. I was glad we saw those guys because when I, as soon as, as soon as I saw them and I saw, I saw that 308, I, that told me right there, it's like, these guys aren't here to playing around and they have that for a reason. And they have to know because they, they asked us, or, you know, you come from that cabin trail. And when, when they told us that I already knew it's like, this is some, this is some bad stuff that's back here. And, um, but we were in the car. It was quiet for a little while. And, um, but we talked, um, I asked her if she was okay. She says, what was that? And I told her, I says, you know what it was. And, um, and all she told me was I would be really good if I didn't see it ever again. We just kind of just left it at that. And I, I felt like, I mean, I, I literally felt like I was, um, I was like almost ready for a nervous breakdown after I had seen that. Just feeling all that, all your emotions, because you're, you're scared. Because you see these things, you hear them, that's one thing. But when you see it, it's pretty damn big. And you feel really inferior, you know, when you see this damn thing. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's one of those things to where you, you do feel inferior. But, you know, I'd never seen ferns grow like this. I'm looking at, uh, in the, as you're talking, I'm looking at, in the background, some of the uh, videos that you sent me. And I've, I think, uh-huh. I've never seen ferns. When you say they're as tall as you, you weren't joking around, man. I've, n- I've never seen ferns grow like that. Oh, I, I could send you, I have more pictures. I have probably at least about, I don't know, probably about a dozen just still pictures of the area that we walked through. And you can't even see the trail. Dude, you cannot see it. the trail. Yeah. And I was, I tell you what, I've been doing this stuff for a long time. And I go out by myself all the time because I have nobody to go with me, you know. And, um, but it's like, and I have a lot of experience. I could take care of myself out there pretty damn good. I know how to survive and stuff. But these, these ferns, I tell you what, walking through this, it scared the hell out of me, man. Because I didn't know at that point if something was going to try to reach out and snatch either both of us or her or or what, you know. It scared the hell out of me. It really did. I mean, I was almost in tears. I just wanted to get the hell out of there. 
Yeah, I don't blame you. And, and and again, going back to the video you sent me, I can imagine how claustrophobic that trail was as you went down it. You know what I mean? Very cla- claustrophobic. In the in the beginning, when we saw that that big tree, and I sent you a, a a video of it of that other tree. I mean, this thing was freaking massive. I mean, it was massive, and it had to be inside, stuck in the middle of the tree, at least about a good eight feet high, at least. I mean, just seeing that, it made it made me nervous really fast, I tell you that much. It made me really damn nervous. Did you get the footprint, the footprint video you sent me? Was that from that same day? No, actually, this was out um, just, this one was out just um, Sunday, just le- this past Sunday. There's another area right where we live. It's up in Yucaipa here in California here in Yucaipa. And we're literally like 20 miles, like 20 minutes away from the actual mountains. We have mountains surrounding us all the way around. And um, there's a place up here near us. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's called Oak Glen. They're known for their apples and stuff like that. Right now, it's apple and berry season. Up in this whole entire area, even up here in the National Forest, there's wild apples up there. There's berries galore up there right now. And these berries are not small. I mean, some of these things are are big as quarters up there. And they're just hundreds and hundreds. I mean, they just go on. And there's a large amount of running rivers, streams, riverbeds. I mean, there's plenty, there's plenty up there. And, and this one trail of Oak Glen that we went on on just, this was last Sunday. We've been on this trail before a couple of other times, but we wanted to walk this one main trail. It's an in and out trail, meaning that there's one way in, it's the same way out. And it measures about almost 12 miles, but it goes about close to a thousand feet up. And the trail is pretty brutal. And they even have warning signs at the actual trailhead when you start. And because, I mean, the temperature changes really fast up there. You get dehydrated. Anything can happen up there. But at the beginning of this trail, at the very beginning of this trail, that's when we noticed, start seeing these footprints. And I was just like, holy crap. I mean, we stopped. You cannot miss these no. footprints yeah. at all. They're pretty good tracks, And I was man. just like. They're pretty good. Too bad you can't cast I mean, them. I, did, I know um, the dirt was, I don't know if you can tell by the video, but the dirt was like super like powder. In the, and most of that dirt in that whole entire area, even though it's a mountain area, it's like a, like a powder. It's real fine. But, you know, you could see tracks. But that's not the only one we saw. Throughout the whole entire trail that we walked up Sunday, that whole entire trail, you could actually see there there was the big ones, but it was just one set of big big footprints. And if I have to, and I and that and by the way, that pink phone that wasn't mine. That was my girlfriend. So, but um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I well, if, that one out there. If, if you don't mind, I'd like to share it on the site. I mean, it's a it's a good track. It's a really good track. And I did notice yeah. that's why I said it's too bad you can't cast it because it looked like it was in sand or. Like you said, the dirt was, you know, almost powder, really, uh, uh-huh. and nothing would stick to it. But that's, um, did you feel like turning around and leaving after, especially after having that incident happen just a month ago? Um, you know what? I've, like I said, I've been going out by myself for quite some time, for a few years now. And um, I have other video footage. I have more pictures. Um, I go up to this place up here near us. It's not that far away. Again, it's in a national forest. I know rangers that work up here. And um, they always tell me, you know what, Theo? You better be careful going out there, man. And I always ask them, what do you, what do you, what do you mean? And um, they always just tell me, they said, just, just be very careful out there. Because we know you go into these areas to where you don't see any other people around. I go into areas to where there's there's no other people around at all. You know, I'm going like 15, 20 miles in in the forest, and like I said, that's that's average for me. You know, so there I go. I'm I'm, I'm just enjoying it, and um, but you know what? Um, 
I've had a few other things happen to me um, out there, and um, I've heard whistles out there. I had the feeling that something was actually following me about maybe three weeks ago when I was out there in, in that area. I, I know something was following me out there. And there's this one particular area as you're walking up through the creek bed, and this creek bed, it goes for miles and miles. There's this one area on the left-hand side as you're walking up the creek bed. You're away from, I mean, you're, you're not around any civilization whatsoever. You're, you're, I mean, miles in. And on the left-hand side, I've never ventured off on the left-hand side of this riverbed up in the actual mountains because you know how you just, you get that feeling something's just telling you, just stay where you're at, just keep on going. Yeah. Well, I always, I always, I've always been told, follow your gut. Your gut's not going to lie to you. For some reason, I've never gone into this one tree line off the riverbed. It's really dark. It's massively thick with trees and manzanita. There's other kinds of bush and stuff like that. I mean, it's just super thick, and it's really dark. And I always take binoculars with me and my compass. I take everything with me. Because if something happens, you don't know if you're going to have to stay the night out there or whatever. I take a little portable tent. I take everything with me. So my pack, most of the time, it weighs between 60 to 65 pounds. A lot of times, it weighs up to 75 pounds, depending on what I have with me. I go, I go out prepared. I tell you what, in this one particular part, I, I don't know what it is, but I always have a weird feeling. And I, and I frequent this area a lot. I mean, a lot. And I, I know all these little pockets of, there's waterfalls, there's, I mean, sources of water. A lot of people don't even know the stuff is back there. I mean, literally, you don't know the stuff is back there. There's springs, natural springs back there that people don't even know exist back there. But there's this one area I, I absolutely refuse to go into. I get a bad feeling. Like if you're being watched in this one particular area, I just, I don't know, I, I, I've never, I've never had the backbone to venture off into this one area back there and I just won't do it. You know, you just, you just get a weird feeling back there really fast. Yeah, sometimes and, it's best to follow your gut in situations like that. Usually your gut's right, like you said earlier. But, you know, it would, it would worry me a little bit going out there, especially by yourself. Um, now you know a seven foot tall, four hundred pound monkey can walk you down a trail. Several of them, uh, you know they exist. Yeah. So you got to be careful. I, I really think in your encounter they were just trying to push you out, push you away from that area, and they did a good job of it. You know, making you leave yeah. without an altercation. Uh, but it is very unnerving when I was watching your video and, and hearing you you recount it. And for the people out there on SasquatchChronicles.com, dot com, I'll post a video, but. Uh, I can see how you'd walk down that man and, and be worried that something might reach out and grab you. I don't blame you one bit for feeling that way coming down that trail. And that is thick, I man. You, it's like Washington State thick there. I mean, even more than yeah. Washington. You know, I would love to take a, a drive up there, you know, in that area where where you're at up there one of these days. And um, I guess you could say I'm kind of like a, a glutton for punishment, you know. <laughs> I mean, there's no other word for it, really, because – it's um i've i've had other things happen to me out there i've had um i've had a, a couple of rocks thrown at me out there just sitting down drinking my gatorade just resting and i was actually i was no more than probably six miles away from the main area to where the parking lot was and i was just literally like maybe six miles at the most inside the tree line but away from where all the tourists hang out and then everybody else, you know, cooking their hot dogs and stuff like that. I mean, I'm in, I'm way in there in, in the thicket and, and I've, I've had things thrown at me before. Not very long ago, I'll send you a picture of this one. I was up in the same general area and I found this huge log. It must, it was, it was a tree. It was a fallen tree, but it was like if the tree was literally ripped out by its roots. There was nothing wrong with this tree. It wasn't dead at all. And this tree was laying down. If I have to 
give a rough estimate of how thick this tree was is I drive a little, um, one of my cars is a Chevy Avio. And it was about half of the thickness of my car. And it was just laying down on its side. Well, the thing that really caught my eye really fast was there were huge pieces of bark from that same tree. And it was made into like a lean-to, leaning against that tree. And these pieces of bark probably were measured probably at least about maybe four feet long. But it was they were placed like a lean-to. And I looked inside, and that lean-to, it was roughly measure probably about at least about a good eight feet eight feet long along the tree and i looked inside and you can see pine needles neatly laid down in in inside that lean to i mean these are pine needles laid laid down in there and i'm just like holy crap but you it stunk you know it's it smelled in there wes i have a, a another piece of a, a video that i took and I frequent this area all the time. As a matter of fact, I'm going back there um, this Saturday. I'll be by myself. And it's another huge tree. And it's, this tree looks like it was rotted out. But there's rocks kind of like border it. And it's probably like at least about a good six-foot area, six-by-six six area. And there's always pine needles, fresh pine needles just laid down in this one area and this is all the time yeah you have to get a video and of that I, i'd love to see it yeah i have actual i have actual video of that on my phone right now i could i could send that to you yeah definitely. and um a lot of people they think because this is california they think about oranges and disneyland and stuff like that but they don't believe they don't understand how how big the national forest is over here you know it's it's huge oh yeah yeah, it's huge. It's really huge. You know, be careful, be safe, especially if you go by yourself. You're a big boy. I'm, you know, I can't tell you one way or another, but be be real careful going by yourself. So many bad things can happen to you uh, while you're out there. And uh, I guess for the audience listening, <laughs> it's a good time to mention, I don't actually have a YouTube channel. I'm not giving you a hard time, Theo, but all of that's pirated. So yeah. if, you're, if you're listening to it on YouTube, it's, oh, it's not okay. me. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, 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 no apologies. No apologies. <laughs> Uh, most people, they think I have all these YouTube channels. I don't. I don't even have, you know, I'm not using one. So, uh, but I appreciate it listening anyway. Hey, I, you know, <laughs> but I, I, I guess, um, you know, with your encounter, I really think they were trying to push you out. But be careful because it can get aggressive really quick with these things, especially if, you know, if you guys yeah. would have spent too much time in that area, they might have actually stepped out to move it to the next level and make you leave. Um, and they have very short tempers, yeah. and but I think they're really just kind of hurting you guys out of there. And they would have kept the same speed. I think if you guys would have ran, they would have just kept up with you. Um, I think if it was going to grab you, it would have. Uh, or if it was going to harm you, it would have. It's interesting about the guys you ran into um, and their reaction to it. You know, asking, did you come down from that trail? You must have had, you must have been white as a ghost coming down. Oh, yeah, I was, I was, I mean, um, I was pretty screwed up. I'm not going to lie to you. And I probably looked like I was too, you know, I, I'm a, kind of a person to where I don't sweat. I don't perspire a lot, but I was drenched. I mean, I was literally oh, yeah. wet. Oh, I believe it. I believe it. Yeah. Just be safe. And, um, you'll have to definitely send me that other video and uh, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing it. I'll definitely have to have you back Theo. It sounds like you're out there a lot and you, you definitely yeah. found the areas. Like I said, that track you found is a pretty good track. All the it's exactly how you described to you where you had your encounter. I mean, I've never seen ferns. First, when he said five six, I thought ah, I don't know about that. Then I saw the video. I was like, holy crap, man! I've never seen ferns grow like that. Because <laughs> out here in Washington, kinda... they're they're only about three feet tall, at, and that's a tall fern. Wow. Here. You don't get them growing uh -huh. six feet tall. But be safe, will you? I mean, just you know, I know you will be, but just be careful. You never know quite the creature you're going to run into or the, the the demeanor, you know, the mood it's in that moment. And, um, yeah. oh, you know, you're, you're probably okay, but just be careful. You know, don't press it too, too much with them. And I'll definitely yeah. have to have you back, man. I really enjoyed talking with you. All righty. Thank you very much. You have a good night. You too. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. 
I will be back on Sunday with the members. Got a really cool show uh, coming up from a, um, a guy that used to be a paper boy back in the day. And he ran into a very strange creature. And also he'll be talking about some of the lights he saw early in the morning. You'll definitely want to stay tuned for that. Until next time, everyone, have a great night. Something a quieter with the lights on.